This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Imagine the vast arid deserts of the American West flowering into a modern day Garden of Eden. Incredible as it seems, a former rocket scientist believes he has found a vast underground river in Nevada that could create just such a transformation. After World War II, a trusting Polish couple sent their only son off to America with friends. They had no idea that they would never see him again. In Los Angeles, Ted Losef, a prominent surgeon, was found dead in his garage. The police ruled suicide, but Ted's mother, Zell, was not convinced. Disturbed by the odd behavior of Ted's wife, Zell began to suspect that her son had been targeted for murder. Zell Losef embarked on her own investigation, an investigation that ultimately forced authorities to reclassify her son's death. Perhaps someone watching tonight will have that one vital clue that could help end Zell Losef's odyssey. Join me. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. doorbell rang at 10 o'clock at night and my daughter and her husband were at the door. I was startled. Company at 10, but when I took a look at their face, I knew I was going to hear something awful. Adonai Roi On February 25th, 1974, Zell Losef of Los Angeles, California, sat numbly through the funeral of her only son, Ted. Two days earlier, the 40-year-old orthopedic surgeon had apparently taken his own life. Zell was devastated. In her grief, she could not have imagined what lay ahead. An all-consuming 19-year investigation into her son's death that would ultimately force authorities to back down from the official finding of suicide. Of all people in the world, Ted was not one to take his life. My son was murdered, definitely. The night Ted Losef died, police found a suicide note, apparently written to his wife, Wilda. The note said simply, all I ever asked for was one moment of compassion and understanding. Zell Losef now believes the note was a finishing touch in a plot to cover up the murder of her son. Congratulations, Ted. This is quite a setup. Well, thanks a lot, Bob. I'm very proud of it. Ted Losef was already a well-respected surgeon oh, when he moved his practice in 1971. Come on back here. I'll give you the quarter tour. Of During a private reception at his new offices, Ted was introduced to a nurse named Will Lloyd. Yeah, you know Dr. Ted Losef? No, no. We don't know. This is Will Deloitte. <laughs> Will Deloitte, how are you? It's a pleasure. Doing? Ted and Wilda were married less than a year later. At Ted's insistence, Wilda signed a prenuptial agreement. She would get no property if the marriage ended in divorce. Within six months, that seemed increasingly likely. How many drinks have you had? What difference does it make? Oh, I know. 50, 100, 200. She I'm had problems with alcohol, and it wasn't good. I soon learned that the marriage was a marriage not of love. Wilda would go into hysteronics and scream and yell and carry on. Uh, the fighting was just awful. It's not fair to throw that in my face. I've got to go out and earn a living. Apparently, the bitter arguing plagued the marriage up until the day Ted Losef died, 
February 23rd, 1974. Officer! Uh, just relax. Officer, you have to help me. My husband, he's got a gun. We have that evening, at like around 8 p.m., an anxious Wilda Losa had called police, saying her husband was armed. Okay. Officer, okay. Officer, listen, let's go inside. Keys, keys, the house May I have the keys? Waiting with Wilda were Edward J., a family friend, yeah, and the Losa's housekeeper. All right, all right, I'll, I'll get the clothes. Ted? Ted didn't answer, and there was no sign of him anywhere in the house. Hello? Well, I don't know where he is, but he's definitely not here. He usually parks outside the gates out there. Yeah, we'll file a report. You hear that? Around the side here. Oh, no. Ted! Stay back. Call an ambulance. They found him in his car in the garage. It had to be suicide. It wasn't until a little later when things began to become so suspicious that I wondered about it. The car was running, the victim was behind the wheel, and this hose was in the tailpipe and fed in through the window. To authorities on the scene, the evidence of suicide was overwhelming, and there was no further investigation. No fingerprints were taken. No autopsy was performed. No questions were asked. I looked for Ted in the house. In the days following Ted's death, Zell and Wilder rarely spoke. He was in the car. When they did finally meet face to face in March of 1974, Zell was totally unprepared for Wilda's behavior. Zell had asked Wilda for a keepsake, a watch she had given her son as a wedding present. It must be hard to talk about. I know you're worried about this. I wasn't worried about this, Zell. I didn't care about Ted the way you did. I'm glad he's gone. Wilda's harsh comments had awakened unfocused suspicions in Zell, and her grief was slowly overtaken by doubts. She began to feel that something was not quite right about the suicide scene. Incredibly, Zell says the discrepancies finally became clear to her in a dream. She recalled that Ted had never parked his car in the garage. I saw a garage filled with Lots and lots of boat equipment, cartons of boxes. And I realized I was at Ted's garage. And I knew that to put his car there, it had to move the things that were in that garage. Ted had back surgery. It was impossible for him physically. And then, I saw the gates, these great big double old iron gates. In her dream, Zell remembered that the driveway gates were damaged and difficult to open. Ted had always parked in front of the house. To Zell, the implications of the dream were simple but stunning. Someone had cleared out the garage and pried open the gates. The suicide had been staged, her son murdered in cold blood. Zell's suspicions alone are not nearly enough to get the case reopened. Taking matters into her own hands, she tracked down her son's former housekeeper. Her account of Ted's last day would confirm Zell's worst fears. Hello. Yes, I'm Zell Losef, and I've been looking for the housekeeper who worked for my son, Ted. Oh, Mrs. Oh. Losef. To protect her identity, we will call the housekeeper Mary. The following recreations are based on her sworn testimony before a Los Angeles County coroner's inquest. Well, I was supposed to arrive at 8.30, but I didn't get there until around 10, and when I arrived, Dr. Losef was in the kitchen. Turn gas lines. Oh, that's okay. I hope your wife isn't angry that I wasn't here earlier. She's 
not uh, going to be around here anymore. We had a little misunderstanding and, well, we're going to be getting a divorce. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. But around 2 o'clock, she came in. She, she parked her car directly in front of the door, and then she went right upstairs. And then a few minutes later, I heard all this screaming and yelling. If you want me to continue to work with you, you'll have to talk to my husband. So he paid me for my work, and I got in my car, and I drove down the street, and there was Mrs. Lusser. Mrs. Lusser, what are you doing? Oh, my God, Mary, what am I going to do? I can't go back there. And then she asked me if she could go with me, and I said, well, yes. So I drove home. She kept insisting that Dr. Losef had a gun, so I called the police. No, officer. No, I'm not the wife. Well, she said that he had a gun. He had a gun. I saw a gun. She insists that he has a gun. Why don't you come talk to him? They told me that they couldn't go over there if I hadn't seen a gun, and I hadn't seen it. Thank you, officer. I'm going to call Dr. Losef. Mary says she tried to call Ted at least 20 times between 3 and 8 p.m. Every time, the line was busy. About 8 o'clock, I call Dr. Losef again. It's ringing, finally. No one's answering. I'm going to call the police again. Within the hour, police had found Ted's body. Their initial belief that he killed himself was confirmed by the discovery of the note in an upstairs bedroom. However, to Mary, it was the first of several alarming discrepancies. I always thought that that note on the shirt cardboard was kind of strange, because I had been ironing Dr. Lusseff's shirts for a long time, and I always used a hanger. I never used a shirt cardboard. What are you saying? As she stood with her husband and gazed at Dr. Losef's body, Mary was jarred by another inconsistency. When I last saw him, he was wearing brown pants and a kind of a mustard shirt. And now he had on gray pants and a dress shirt. And do you know, that whole time that I worked there, after Dr. Losef died, I never once saw those brown pants and that mustard-colored shirt that he was wearing the last time I saw him. The discrepancies became impossible to ignore. In the kitchen, Mary found several empty beer cans and four dirty glasses. Ted Losef rarely drank. Mrs. Losef, can you come here a minute, please? A week later, Mary found unusual stains on some bedspreads in the guest room. Well, this looks like vomit. Oh, uh, yes, this is, this is the dog's vomit. They were sick last night. However, Just Mary now. remembers the dogs being in a kennel at that time. When she later washed the bedspreads, the vomit spots completely disintegrated. After hearing the housekeeper's many stories, I knew there was foul play and something terrible happened to Ted and that I had to find out. There is evidence of food fiber in the bronchi of the lungs. In 1978, four years after her son's death, Zell finally won a legal battle to have Ted's body exhumed for an autopsy. The pathologist found undeniable evidence that Ted had suffered a violent vomiting spell in the moments before his death. There should have been vomitus on his clothing, his face, and perhaps on the inside of the car. Why wasn't it there? This certainly strongly suggests to me that this vomiting occurred someplace other than in the car. And there were a number of discrepancies that have never been explained, but that 
very strongly move away from the whole thought of suicide. This, until proven otherwise, is a homicide. Fueled by the autopsy findings, Zell pieced together a theory explaining her son's death, a scenario of premeditated murder. Zell believes Ted was assaulted soon after Wilda and Mary left the house. I believe that the people that killed my son were close to the wife because they knew that that back door would be open. The autopsy indicated Ted had been involved in a struggle. Zell believes he was overpowered by at least two men who forced poison down his throat. Ted was definitely fighting for his life, according to the doctors. Somebody took the phone off after they made sure he was dead because it took a certain length of time for this to happen. It could be five, six, seven minutes. Then they uh, cleaned him up and they put his gray dress shirt on him. Then they went to the garage, emptied out the garage to make room for the car. Then they had to open the gates to put his car into this garage, carry his dead body into that garage, close the door, and then go out and close the gates. Then they went back into the house, I think, again, put the receiver back on the hook. It's ringing, finally. All afternoon, Mary had been getting busy signals when she tried to call Ted. Now the phone was suddenly ringing. Zell believes that this was a prearranged message from the killers to Wilda that their job was done. In March of 1982, the Los Angeles County Coroner finally ordered an inquest. Zell's murder scenario, which many had dismissed as a grieving mother's fantasy, began to gain credibility. At the inquest, a witness who knew the family testified that the note, the alleged suicide note, was indeed written by Ted. However, he had written it after an argument with Wilda more than two years before he died. The inquest ultimately ruled that Ted Losef's death was a homicide. But the most critical witness in the subsequent investigation would soon be lost forever. On May 1st, 1983, Wilda died from an overdose of drugs and alcohol. More than two years later, the police completed their inquiry. They ruled that the cause of Ted Losef's death was undetermined. However, Zell Losef is convinced that someone has gotten away with murder. She is still hopeful a witness will come forward with new information. If the case would open up and they'd really get the criminal, there'll be a peacefulness that'll come on me, I hope, a desire to walk, to sing, to laugh. I haven't been able to. If I can do that again, that's it. Next, controversy surrounds a modern-day prospector and his claim that he has found a vast untapped water supply in the middle of the desert. Even in a good year, precious little rain will fall in the rugged deserts of the western United States. What doesn't evaporate instantly is quickly soaked up by the few plants and animals evolution has sentenced to live here. However, numerous legends have sprouted in this otherwise infertile land, tales such as the lost Dutchman's mine or the missing gold of Peg Leg Smith. In 1927, a prospector named Earl Dorr drove deep into the Nevada desert, lured by an old Indian legend. It told of a secret cavern leading to an underground river that sparkled with nuggets of gold. Earl Dorr was just crazy enough to believe he could find it. 
According to an affidavit Dorr later published, he and his sidekick eventually found the secret opening foretold in the legend and squeezed on through. The affidavit recounts a treacherous 3,500-foot descent into a murky subterranean canyon. Earl claimed that at the bottom, they found the legendary river, running as promised far below the cactus and the scorpions. Earl said they explored for four days, following the river for eight long miles. Along every foot of it, nature had slowly concentrated vast amounts of gold. What he's describing is something like the world's largest natural underground sluice, where light rocks are carried away by the water, and the heavier minerals, like your gold, your platinum group metals, rare earths, would be settling out and concentrating. So it's almost kind of a too-good-to-be-true thing. Earl claimed that the rich black sands assayed out at a phenomenal 100 ounces of gold per cubic yard. At today's prices, a bucket of this fancy dirt would be worth close to $1,500. It was the stuff dreams are made of. However, Earl Dorr had one very major problem. Someone else owned the land where the entrance to the cavern was located. Believing that he could find another way in, Dorr decided to dynamite the original opening. Earl Dorr was never able to find his treasure again. Over the next 50 years, others would follow in his path, but the location of the river, if it existed, seemed lost forever. Oddly, it was a space shuttle program of the 1980s that suddenly opened the door to the rediscovery of what might be Earl Dorr's fantastic river. Successive missions brought back new and more remarkable photographs of our planet. Some of the pictures came to the attention of a scientist named Wally Spencer. For 30 years, Spencer had been involved in the development of solid rocket motors for NASA and other government agencies. When he studied the space shuttle photographs, Spencer was convinced they offered a down-to-earth opportunity. In one picture of Nevada, Wally spotted what he believed was an ancient river channel, bone dry for some 500 million years. But eons ago, plants would have flourished along such a river. In the millennia since, those plants would have slowly decomposed into black gold, Nevada's own crude oil. You ready to power up then? Yeah, let's do it. Wally Jerry rigged a prospecting device from common laboratory instruments. He based his design on two simple facts. First, the Earth naturally emits a low level of radiation. Second, a large subsurface pool of liquid, such as oil, will block this radiation. Wally believed that his invention could detect such a drop in radiation, thus revealing the location of a hidden reservoir. But Wally had no idea if his device actually worked. In June of 1989, with the help of his wife and son, Wally put it to the test. For three weeks, they bounced across the sands, waiting for the device to react. Whoa, Barry, stop, stop, hold it, hold it. We went off scale, I don't know, something happened, we went totally off scale. The wild response at first suggested a monumental deposit of oil, but further testing began to indicate to Wally that they had actually found an immense underground river, perhaps the same river Earl Dorr had boasted about half a century before. It's got to be something huge. It was very disappointing when we found out it wasn't oil, because once we started mapping it, it looked like the river. And everybody says, hey, you found the river. You didn't find a pocket of oil. Very disappointing. But it was so large that uh, it had to be exciting. Wally became convinced he had found a virtually inexhaustible water supply. He estimated the flow could be an incredible 17 billion gallons a day. In a parched region like Nevada, water is as precious as gold. Wally Spencer was certain he had found a priceless resource. There is enough water for 170 gallons a day for 100 million people. Now that has got to be something that is extremely of interest 
to the Western United States, to Nevada, to our nation as a whole. The land I'm standing on here in Los Angeles was once a virtual desert. But with water piped from hundreds of miles away, it became a flourishing garden. Wally Spencer's river, if it does exist, could likewise transform Nevada. But for Wally, that remained just a pipe dream when he found himself mired down in a bureaucratic standoff with state officials. Nevada law required that anyone drilling for water first apply for a permit, and that meant revealing the river's location. Before doing so, Wally asked state officials to guarantee that he would receive a finder's fee even though the state would own any water that he found. However, authorities insisted that Wally apply for a drilling permit, just like anybody else. No promises, no guarantees. If I filed for appropriations permit, then it, would, it could be denied on any kind of whim, whimsical notion the state has, like not in the best interest of the people or not in the best interest best interests of the state. They would own it. I would have nothing. There's nobody that's going to try to rob him of his water rights. There might be other speculators out here that try to, might also claim that he has priority if he files the proper documentation. And a lawyer can help him do that. You really think it's necessary? Wally and his wife Beverly were not Wally, convinced, we and they weren't the, taking we any chances. Really Concerned that others might try to steal the secret of their finds, the Spencers asked two experts to scan their house for electronic bugs. Oh, interesting books. At first, the sophisticated equipment failed to locate any hidden listening devices. But then one sensor picked up a bug on the phone line. You see? It's the kind of thing we're talking about. In addition, the investigators found a high-tech listening device secreted in the living room. Beverly was convinced that only one thing would motivate the electronic eavesdropping. They were trying to um, probably find out the location. We never discussed the location of the water. It's not in our vocabulary. So I don't know who did it. I don't know why they did it. But they haven't gained from it. However, there are those who question whether Wally Spencer has any information that is truly worth stealing. He has never revealed his technology. He can't show where the water's coming from. He can't show where the water's going. And he won't reveal the location. So it's not a lot different than the guy that's walking around the desert with a willow stick or a peach branch and and dousing for water, or the guy that's walking around the crust of the earth with a turquoise bead on a gold chain, witching for water. I've known Wally for about 15 years, and actually I've worked professionally with him uh, starting about 10 years ago. Um, Wally's one of the true scientist um, problem solvers uh, that you can run into. He's the type of guy that doesn't run to the textbook to pull out the equation to solve the problem. He takes Newton's equations and he derives what he needs out of them to solve the problem. So he's a, a true scientist. You know, I'd like it to be true. I mean, I, I don't think you'll find anybody in Nevada that wants to find water resources like, uh, like Wally has described. But you have to be practical at the same time. And the way to be practical is just simple questions. Wally, what have you found with that technology? And the second thing is, let me see it. <music> When we return, one of your tips leads to the arrest of a murder suspect. October 8, 1988, Los Angeles, California. Four friends climbed on their motorcycles to cruise the nearly deserted streets. It was a frequent weekend ritual. 26-year-old Lee Selwyn, a popular local DJ, always looked forward to the freewheeling late-night rides. But this night would be different. One of the cyclists became involved in an argument because he believed a vehicle was trying to run him down. What are you trying? What are you trying to do? Huh? What do you want? What do you want to kill? 
When the driver spit in the face of Lee's friend, the altercation turned ugly. The four riders scattered. Although Lee Selwyn had been a completely innocent bystander, he became the target. The chase went on for nearly 30 city blocks at speeds of up to 100 miles an hour. Lee Selwyn was thrown 180 feet and suffered a massive skull fracture. He was rushed to the hospital, but died within hours. I received a call from Cedars. They said that he was in the intensive care. And I knew, I just knew. But I don't believe it yet. It's real, but it isn't real. He was such a big part of my life. He was my buddy. He wasn't just my son, he was my buddy. The Los Angeles police began a citywide manhunt, but Lee Selwyn's killer had skipped town. Incredibly, four years went by before police finally got the tip they'd been waiting for. After a recent rebroadcast of the story, a viewer called our phone center and told one of the operators that there was a man in prison in Georgia who had often bragged about running down a biker in Los Angeles. The Los Angeles police obtained a mugshot of the suspect. Lee's friends picked the man out of a photo lineup. His name is Franklin LeGrand Perkins. On July 30th, 1993, just five days before Perkins was scheduled for parole, he was arrested. One week later, he was brought back to Los Angeles by Detective Dan Andrews. Most murder victims know their attackers, know their killers. But this is a case that, that just wasn't that way. This was a random event uh, of, of a person who was basically minding his own business and, and unfortunately was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I think it's very unusual to identify somebody and be able to solve a case after five years. It's a very good feeling. Except for the most important fact, which is nothing can ever bring Lee back. I hope this will bring some closure to this five years of uncertainty and the pain that goes along with it. Finally, justice can be served. And, and also, I'm grateful that this man is not out there committing other crimes and hurting other people and killing other people's loved ones. One portion of the grief will be closed or dealt with. And I know that when I'm driving on the streets, I won't be looking in other cars. Wondering if that might be the guy. Next, a young boy is lost to his family in the aftermath of World War II. Plymouth, England, 1952. Even though seven years have passed since the end of World War II, this British port city is still surrounded by refugee camps for families displaced by the ravages of war in Eastern Europe. Helena and Apolinary Karowski, a Polish couple, are sending their son Christopher off to America with another family. The tearful farewell would prove sadly prophetic. Though Christopher Karowski was only five years old, he would never see his parents again. For Helena Karowski, the loss of her son was a heavy blow in a life already marred by tragedy. In 1928, Helena had married a dashing infantry officer in the Polish army. After the Nazis invaded in 1939, he was executed. Helena was taken prisoner and forced to serve as a nurse in a German prisoner of war camp for six harrowing years. 
Shortly before the end of the war, a German officer helped Helena escape. Alone, she crossed the border to Austria, then occupied by the Allies. It was a dramatic story, which Helena would tell her daughter, Michelle, time and time again. My mother was walking down the road, and then here comes this Polish Red Cross Army truck. And all of a sudden, the truck stops. Would you like a ride to the town? You look very tired. <sighs> yeah. Can yeah. I help? All right, let's go. She decided that she would let this man help her. And he took her to where all the Polish people were, looked after her, did things for her that nobody had done for her since the war had been going on. Her heart was beginning to, to come alive again, something it hadn't done since the war had happened. I am a Polona. Helena. And he asked her to marry him, and so she said yes. Helena began a new life with Apollinary Kurowski. They stayed on in Austria even after the war was over. In October of 1946, they adopted an infant and named him Christopher. Within a month, the Kurowskis joined thousands of war survivors flooding into England and into refugee camps. Apollinary found work as a mechanic. In 1950, Michelle was born. Christopher finally had a sister to play with. My only memory of Christopher is uh, a real happy memory. He would run around me, hide behind me, and all of a sudden he'd come around to the front and he'd go, boo. And I'd laugh and I'd laugh, and I can still remember to this day the giggles. The giggles, I was giggling so hard. It felt so good, so good. Next. Like so many other refugees, Helena and Apollinari dreamed of a better life for themselves and their children. Uh, take, a, take a seat. Thank you. How can I help you? We want to go to America to make a visa. Just two of you? No, no. We have also two children. Yeah. As it turned out, the Karavskis would wait months for permission to emigrate. We will try. Another Polish family living in the camp had better luck. Listen, I have news for you. Today I got the visa. Now we will be going to America! You're going to America? Stop. Oh, congratulations, oh. my friend. Oh, oh, my oh, we'll have a toast for you. <laughs> when do we get to go to America? Christopher, you must be patient. We will go soon. You want to go to America too, huh? I have an idea. Why don't you let me, Christopher, come with me and my family to America? He will play with my children, he will go to school, and soon you will be going to America yourselves. I thought you should get sick, huh? The decision was made. Christopher would go on before the rest of his family so he could start first grade in the United States. I'll miss you, Mama. I'll miss you too, Christopher. My mother didn't really want to send him with somebody else, but my father kept saying, you know, education, education. He's going to get a good education. He's going to be able to start school. So it was easier for him. But my mother, I guess being a woman, it just tore at her heart. Uh, Helena, sit down. I need to talk to you. Weeks went by. Helena and Apollinary continued to wait for their visas. They talked of little else but America, and outlandish rumors about life in that unknown land circulated I, I, throughout the camp. I don't to worry you, but you know, I got this letter from my friend. She went to America. Yeah. Well, she says that in California, if you leave your baby outside, it could get kidnapped. Kidnapped? By monkeys. Yeah. Papa Manari, did you hear this? Mother got scared. She had gone through so much during the war, and the things that she had seen had made her so scared that this was another unknown to her, and she didn't know whether she could really make it. In the end, 
Helena and Apollinari made the agonizing decision to withdraw their visa application. They wrote to the family who had taken Christopher, asking them to send him back to England. Helena! Helena! Yeah? I've received a letter from America. America? Yes, they, are don't, they don't send Christopher back. What? They don't send Christopher back. My parents got a letter back from the family uh, in the United States saying that uh, Christopher had already settled in school, had made friends, and they weren't going to send him back. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I have a very big problem. They cannot wait. Helena and Apollinari immediately went to the refugee camp's Polish consul. They cannot do this to us. He was sympathetic, but all of Christopher's adoption records had gone to the United States, making it nearly impossible to bring the boy back. The Karowskis eventually left the camp and settled near Nottingham. They continued to write to the family who had taken Christopher, but received no response. In 1966, when Michelle turned 16, she decided it was time to find her brother. It was hard to look for him. I really didn't know where to start, so I had to ask people where to look. And one person told me to write to the American Embassy and then put a letter inside there for Christopher, just in case they found Christopher. And that's what I did. Two months later, Michelle received a reply. Mama! Mama! I never thought in a million years that I would actually find him. I was jumping up and down, I was running around. It was one of the happiest moments of my life. I wrote back right away, but I didn't get an answer. I waited and I waited, checked the postman, always oh, stopped the postman, asked him if he had any letters for me that were coming from America, nothing. I didn't get anything back. No letter, return to sender, nothing. The Karowskis were crushed by the lack of further news. In 1973, Michelle moved to the United States. After Apollinari died, Helena finally came to America herself. Last April, she passed away. Helena's dying wish was that her children would someday be reunited. Join me next time for another edition of Unsolved Mysteries.